Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the third year of Entrepreneurs Unplugged series. And I'm happy to report that we're still not really unplugged. We've got all sorts of electronics and we've added a few cameras to, uh, to the plug-in situation. Uh, but we've yet to be sued by the FTC for misleading customers with the name. So we'll, we'll continue to, to go this direction. And we're kind of starting this year's session where we left off last year. Um, how many people were here for the April session with Brad for Unplugged? <coughs> awesome. So uh, for those of you who were not, we're going to pick up where we left off. However, W3W3 has the segment from the April session, so if you want to get caught up, uh, that's something you can do. Um, how many people here from CU, whether you're faculty, staff, students? Wow, that's Yahtzee for us. That's sort of the purpose. Um, awesome. And uh, not to marginalize those from the community, but those from the community, go ahead and raise <laughs> well, It's like a 50 50 split, really. And in terms of people who are from the community, if you are a founder uh, or part of a management team of an emerging company, uh, hands. Looks like about one third of the audience. All right, great. Um, I'm Brad Bernthal. I am the director of the Entrepreneurship <laughs> Initiative for the Silicon Flatiron Center. I'm glad to have you here for the kickoff of Entrepreneurs Unplugged 2011. Uh, this is Jill Van Matry. She is the associate director here at the at Atlas. And um, I just want to say that Jill and Atlas have been an amazing partner of, on this really from the start. And uh, in terms of someone who's really helping build the entrepreneurial infrastructure here, if you don't know what Atlas does, I encourage you to follow up with Jill and learn a little bit, bit more about what their options, and then we'll uh, get started. So first, um, why lean practices work, how to scale them. Zach uh, from <coughs> CQ of Rally will be doing a, uh, a discussion that's September 20th at 6 p.m. Second is on September 23rd, we've got a conference on innovation at the Silicon Flatiron Center. Uh, Michael Center Bennett and Qualcomm founder Erwin Jacobs will be among the keynote speakers there. And third, preview uh, in terms of coming attractions is our Entrepreneurs Unplugged session for October. It's going to be Paul Guerin, who is the CEO of Revit. Um, for tonight, this series has turned out to be a terrific success. In fact, I think Dan Caruso is here. Dan was our first guest for Entrepreneurs Unplugged uh, when we launched the series. Uh, in terms of format, for those of you who are new to this, it is fairly straightforward. This is Model 20 of the Actors Studio. We'll have 50 or 60 minutes of Q&A with Jill and I, and in the last 15, 20 minutes, we'll open it up to the audience. Um, as I said, we're starting, in some respects, where we left off in April. Um, and in the April Unplugged event, for those of you who are here, I thought it was just really going well, that Brad was just doing terrific, you know, it was providing insight, and then, I looked up, and we're almost at a time, and you weren't, I don't think, quite at puberty in terms of telling your story. <laughs> uh, I was still talking like this. <laughs> a colossal mismanagement of time on, on my part, not, not chills. Um, but it was really a happy accident. Maybe I just can't shut up. <laughs> uh, and so uh, in terms of uh, happy accidents, it worked out great. Brad kindly agreed to come back and do a second session. And here we are. We'll be picking up, by and large, um, with Brad moving from his role as an entrepreneur into the venture capital world, and we'll go from there. Um, since Brad was here in April, a couple things that I want to quickly plug and give Brad a, comment, a chance to comment on if he wants. First of all, release a book, Venture Deals, with his partner, Jason Mendelson. Best question gets a signed copy tonight. And I, get, I get to define what best question is. <laughs> uh, debuted as a video star, which some of you saw out there. <laughs> Uh, and also, tomorrow night, Techstars premieres on Bloomberg TV. One quick word about that? Yeah, so Bloomberg um, videoed the entire Techstars New York program, our first program there. Um, they have done a documentary. People can hear me okay? It's loud to me, but I just want to make sure it's not too loud. Um, they, they did a, what's essentially a documentary, six, six episodes, 30 minutes each. The, the sixth one, or maybe the seventh one, I can't remember where they're going to end, is actually going to be a live episode uh, in mid-October in New York that I'll be a big part of. Um, it tracks all the teams through the program, which focuses on about a half a dozen of them. It's got a little bit of a reality TV flair to it uh, in terms of intensity and drama, but there's zero scripting. So they really made a documentary, and I've seen a little bit of it, and it's really <coughs> intense because they have so much film that they were able to make these 25-minute shows 
move through really quickly. And their goal, the reason they did it was that Bloomberg is trying to get a better handle and do a better job with the entrepreneurial universe. They've got um, a show called Bloomberg West that runs a couple of times a day. It's very focused on the West Coast. And um, it was really interesting to do and really fun to do. So you know, tomorrow night we're having a big uh, sort of opening event, and then I think right after to, to premiere it, and then afterwards they're doing a reverse job fair where the companies pitch uh, people in the audience uh, what they're doing as they're looking you know, to hire lots of folks. And then there'll be parties, so if, if you're looking for nerds tomorrow night, there'll be plenty of That's like any night in Boulder. Oh, wait, yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, in terms of where, let's start with your transition from entrepreneur to becoming a venture capitalist and especially the time with what's going to be the Mobius Fund. Um, I think you started in 1996 or thereabouts. By 1999, you guys raised $630 million. 2000, you raised a $1.25 billion fund. Talk about your transition to Mobius and especially how that sets up how you arranged the Foundry Fund um, afterwards. Sure. So um, as, as Mobius evolved, and just for those of you that didn't hear that story the last time, um, SoftBank Venture Capital was a fund that I founded with three other people in 1990. We, we raised our first fund in 1997, founded in 96, but raised our first fund in 1997. Over time, um, we changed the name of that firm from SoftBank Venture Capital <coughs> to Mobius Venture Capital, I believe in 2000 or 2001, I think it was 2001. Um, same business, same structure. But just called Mobius. So a lot of people confuse this idea that I was at SoftBank and then at Mobius, but I was actually at the same entity all the way through. We just changed our name. We we had the name SoftBank because our initial sponsor was a Japanese company called SoftBank Corporation, which was an early investor in Yahoo. And interestingly, just recently sold um, uh, the rest of their Yahoo shares, almost all. I think they still own like a ten percent of Yahoo. They're a very large early investor. They bought Zip Davis. They bought Comdex. They bought a bunch of other companies and made lots of investments in companies like E-Trade and a bunch of other early sort of internet-based businesses. Very, very large Japanese technology company, very successful. And they were investing in US-based companies through a vehicle called SoftBank Capital or SoftBank Ventures or something like that, of which um, there were a group of us that were working with them. So, uh, there were a team that worked for SoftBank, then myself, Fred Wilson, uh, who's now partner at Union Square Ventures, a guy Jerry Colonna, and a guy Rich Levendov, who's now at Avalon Partners, were all affiliates. I had moved out here, so I was sort of finding deals and bringing SoftBank deals and doing them here. Jerry and Fred were kind of doing that in New York. Rich was doing that mostly in Boston, but a little bit elsewhere. And SoftBank had committed a half a billion dollars to this team. And about $200 million in, uh, they ran out of money. And you know, I can imagine the call that uh, one of the partners got, uh, Gary Rochelle, who was sort of the lead of the whole thing, working for SoftBank, saying, hey, we need another $25 million to do all these deals we've got lined up. And somebody from SoftBank from Japan said, I'm sorry, we don't have any money. We spent it all on a baseball team that was just bought or something. Yeah. And it, you know, if any of you have ever been in a, a venture fund, uh, or been close to a venture fund, the absolute worst thing that can happen when you're active is to just run out of money. Because you have all of these existing companies that you've committed to, that you've already funded, that will need follow-on money because we're early stage investors. And then you have all of these new companies that you've committed to or you're working on. We have probably 10 or 15 companies that we have term sheets out to and we're actively negotiating deals. And you know, all of a sudden we're impotent. We, we can't write a check. And that, that was a really hard moment in time. That, that lasted about a year. Um, SoftBank gave us a little bit of money. Uh, it was $13 million, And we invested that in a handful of companies. One of them, which you may have heard of, is a company called GeoCities. Um, so it was one of the companies that we sort of invested at this period of time. And we went out and raised a $300 million fund. But they were our sponsors, so we called ourselves SoftBank Technology Ventures. Uh, the 97 fund was uh, $300 million, was very successful. The 99 fund was $600 million complete debacle. The 2000 fund was 1.25 billion, and it's invested, still pretty active. Uh, some of the local companies that it's involved, invested in, you may know, are Rally Software, uh, with large investors there, Return Path, uh, which is here in New York, uh, Still Secure, which is Office of Superior, um, NewsGator, which is in Denver. Um, 
and that fund will end up uh, being a successful fund, although modestly, and certainly not from a cash on cash return, particularly impressive for something that was, was out in 15 years. But for a fund raised in 2000 that was so big to get the money back was kind of victory at some level. Um, I believe we changed our name in 2001. By about 2000, up to 2000, we were the only early stage investor for SoftBank. So any early stage venture capital investments that happened in the US were done through our funds. And we were part of this constellation of funds SoftBank had done, including um, a bunch of stuff internationally, a joint venture with News Corp, a joint venture with uh, Vendi, of which I was involved in a few of because a couple of companies I was invested in that had gone public, did JDs with those. A complete fucking debacle. I mean, every one of those, uh, I'm zero for six in international deals, um, and just excruciatingly painful. Not only are they far away, to travel, you have to go to them, the time zones are different, the cultures are different, and man, the French know how to fuck you up. I mean, they are just masterful at it in ways that, that U.S. investors don't understand. Um, and so, about yeah, it had to be 2001, because the bubble had, it, you know, the things peaked in sort of the spring of 2000, started to steady decline. And by 2001, a bunch of the international stuff that SoftBank was doing was a mess. They had created a late stage fund that invested in companies like WebVan. And we were, in Cosmo was another one, we were constantly sort of in this, um, you know, well, you guys are the idiots that invest in web, and we're like, no, no, we've got a lot of other stupid deals, but that one's SoftBank. <laughs> oh, wait, we're SoftBank. I understand the confusion. And, you know, for a while, it was very beneficial to be affiliated with SoftBank, and at this moment in time, it was very confusing. And we just bit the bullet and said, look, we're a separate thing, we're on the thing, let's change our name. And that's what became Mobius. Um, it was a very, very difficult time around 2001, because in 97, 98, 92 market was very hot. The uh, startup market was very hot. Um, we had, you know, sort of huge, very fast velocity in terms of the companies. The performance was very strong. And our investing velocity fast. We invested, um, we're investing in about a company a week. So, you know, over the course of a year, we would do maybe not 50 investments, but 30 or 40 investments over 1,200 new investments, not, you know, obviously all <coughs> So by, and, and we kept raising these larger and larger funds, but we continued to invest in very early stage companies. So we had lots and lots and lots of companies, which when everything was going great was no big deal. But when things reversed in the, you know, started reversing or peaked in the spring of 2000, started reversing throughout the summer, by the fall of 2000, you know, everything was in decline. Um, by the beginning of 2001, you know, it was, it was pretty messy. By the time 9-11 came, you know, 9-11, while you know, was a seminal event in terms of, you know, uh, sort of broader dynamics, in my mental model, it was kind of the capitulation moment for the internet bubble. So it was kind of like, you're getting the shit beat out of you, and then 9-11 happens. And they're, they're disconnected events. Obviously, one's not a technology business event, one's a tragic human event. But it was kind of this thing where you sort of sat back and said, what am I doing? What matters? How am I spending my time? How am I sorting through all of this? And um, from 2001, I really, had, my bad year was 2001. I had a terrible year. I, I had 10 companies that I shut down. I had, you know, I, I learned what ABC was. I had bankruptcies. I got sued. I mean, sort of all the things that you expect. I had lots and lots of companies that were sort of constantly struggling to stay alive. Companies that were public. One company that went public, a company called People PC. Does anybody remember People PC? So it was worth a billion dollars for one man of sound. It went public at ten dollars a share. We had slightly over a hundred million shares out. Market cap was like a billion, you know, one hundred thousand. The first trade <coughs> makes me cry just to think about it. Um, the first trade, literally the first trade of the stock was eight bucks a share. So in the IPO, it lost two hundred million dollars in its market cap within a nanosecond. Um, and then the stock never, I don't ever think the stock traded higher on a single day. I mean, it was just a curve like, I'm not sure it happened like this, but it was just a steady slide down. And when the company got bought by Earthlink, it was bought for two and a half cents a share. So, you know, what are you doing in a company like that as a board member? <coughs> I'll come back to how this impacts how we think about things they found in there. If, if, you know, you're a public company and your market cap is declining every day and you're running out of capital and your employee, you've got, you know, a thousand employees and everybody's freaked out because whatever stock options they got yesterday were, 
not, no longer worth anything. You spend all your time sort of in this defensive mode trying to deal with this stuff coming at you, and you don't spend any time really on the business. And you know, constantly you know having discussions about Nasdaq delisting and reverse stock splits and granting our options to employees, and we gotta you know put put retention packages in place for people, and nothing to do with like is our business any good or not? And our business wasn't, which was part of the reason why it went to zero. Um, or almost zero. So that was a lot of the stuff sort of in that time period. In 2002, I only really had one bad thing, which was a company I co-founded, Air Alliance, which at its peak was worth $300 <coughs> billion dollars went bankrupt. And I was co-chairman of that company. And then I got sued after that, after the company went through bankruptcy, which was a very difficult situation, which ended up, it was also difficult because at, at that time, people were going to jail for companies going bankrupt. So, you know, it was very uncomfortable because it was very uncertain. It ended up being <coughs> non-issue in terms of the end result being the people at CBIS were going after the d &O insurance. But it's very anxiety producing. And it also kind of causes you to step back and think about how am I trying, what am I trying to do here in terms of this business creation. The rest of the venture business had a terrible, terrible year in 2002. So I was kind of through most of my shit. Not all of it, but most of it. And I spent a lot of time in 2002 reflecting on what was going on, sort of trying to get some balance uh, and, and understand what happened. I did something, after, I was in New York on 9-11, I wrote a blog post about it yesterday, like a bunch of people did, sort of remembering it. So you can read that until it's um, And at the, uh, I, drove, I drove home from New York with, with Paul Bavarian, who was the CEO of Rain Dance, which I was on the board of, and Nick Cachero, who was his uh, CFO. And I didn't travel for three months. I didn't get on a plane for three months. First time I had, you know, every other week as an adult. And so I, I kind of got into this changing my view of what was important and how I wanted to spend my time and where I wanted to focus. Um, by 2003, we had sort of accepted reality with Mobius and we were starting to scale the organization back. So we would added a lot of partners from those original four partners. Two of, one of them left in 99, one of them left in 2002. Um, but we'd added a bunch more. I think at the peak, we were at 10 or 11 people, 10 or 11 deal partners. We were at 60 people in the organization. And by uh, 2004, we were down to about 20 people in the organization and six deal partners. But just to do the math here, you said 11 deal partners for a $1.25 billion fund. That's about $100 million per partner. $100 million per partner, plus we had all the old stuff. Well, we had a lot of junior people, so we had, you know, let's say 10 partners and 20 associates, principals, whatever title you wanted. So we kind of managed the load effectively. I don't think it was, I don't think it was a load issue. I think if you kind of look back on, on the dynamic, at, at Mobius, and sort of link it to sort of the ideas around founding at Mobius, we didn't really have a strategy, right? Our strategy was just invest money in companies. And that's not really a strategy. Now, we defined our universe as internet. And over time, you know, we had some stratification, so we had different sectors that partners were focused on, and we had, you know, place, you know, a certain amount of early stage and mid stage and stuff like that. But fundamentally, when I sort of reflect on it, there wasn't a, a set of deeply held beliefs about what we were going to do as a firm. And we ended up doing what a lot of other venture firms do, especially as they grow, is that you end up just chasing the market. And if you look at what happens chronically, especially in places like Silicon Valley. You have an awful lot of activity where people are chasing the market. It's good for a while when everything's going up. You know, if you're chasing everything going up, that's okay. If you're chasing everything as going down, it sucks. And inevitably, these are cycles. And so if you don't have sort of a long-term strategy or long-term prediction, um, you end up in a place that's often very confusing because things change very fast. And because you don't have these deeply held beliefs, you don't really know what to do. So that was a period of, uh, for me, of having to work through that in a very significant way. Um, I think some people know this. I, I spent an enormous amount of time, up until 2003, I spent almost no time managing Mobius. Even though I was one of the original four partner, I did investments, I was very active, a lot of my investments were successful, plenty of my investments were not. I was very prolific, like I said, I was a very promiscuous deal guy, I did lots of stuff. And the, uh, the, the end result of that was when the shit hit the fan, I had a lot of shit to but I was aggressive about it. I got through it quickly. And by 2003, I was sort of in this place personally where I was really unhappy with where Mobius the firm was. 
And I kind of had a choice. I mean, we were taking people out, and we were downscaling, and we were trying to deal with things. Um, but I, I, I just didn't feel like we had control over the back office. I didn't feel like the firm was very well run. Um, I didn't feel like we were doing a good job sort of internally. I don't like being the operating guy. Um, and I was perfectly happy doing my own deals. But I had a, really a choice, which was, do I just punch out and leave? Or and just go do something else? Or do I stay? And if I stay, I can't just sit passively by and watch this shit go on. I've got to actually engage in it. And it might, I might make it worse. I don't want to make it better. But I've at least got to put myself into it. And so what ended up, sorry, what ended up happening was um, <clears throat> I got very involved in 2003. By 2004, you know, I was effectively running the back office part of our organization with Jason Mendelson, who's, who's my partner now. He was our CFO, or our COO, sorry. He was our general counsel, and essentially went from being our general counsel to being COO effective, running the back office, and then started doing deals. I took care of all that with Jason. Eventually, he sort of took over that, and I started paying a lot more attention to the face part of our firm. Venture funds typically raise a new fund on a three or four year basis. So for those of you that don't know how venture funds work, we got a $1.25 billion commitment in 2000 from our investors. That didn't mean $1.25 billion went in our bank account. That meant we had a whole bunch of investors who said, we will give you, whenever you ask us, the percentage we owe of whatever you ask. And you draw that money down over a 10 to 12 year period. You commit it over a five year period. So for five years, you can make new investments in companies. And from year six forward, you're outside your commitment period. So you can invest in existing companies that you've already invested in, follow-on rounds, et cetera. But you can't make new investments. So most venture funds raise a new fund every three or four years. So they constantly have fresh capital and a new fund to invest in new companies. And then they use the old fund to continue to follow on the old companies. Um, if a venture fund has not raised a fund by year six, it's out of the and really, most, not all, but most venture funds that don't have a refresh by the sixth year are effectively out of business. They're out of business five years later because they still have all these companies. They still have the committed capital. They still have some fees to run their business, although those fees are typically declining. But there was a reason why they weren't able to raise another fund, usually performance, LP dynamics, partner dynamics, whatever. And we were in this place in 2005 where we had to decide whether we were going to raise another fund or not. Uh, as Mobius, we didn't really have to decide in 2000, until 2006, because it's not such a bad thing if you're out of the market for six or nine months, and that was kind of an icy time anyway. In uh, early in 2006, in February, we got together, the remaining partners, the other co-founder, Gary, had decided to move to China and started a fund there, so essentially I was the only remaining founder. It was a California-based firm, I had a small team here, but everybody else was in California. And everybody had joined either in nine, that was left, joined in 1999 or 2000. So everybody joined sort of at the, the peak of the bubble. So the track record of the remaining partners was not uh, generous. It was not very strong. Um, you know, ranging from not very strong to abysmal. And, and then, there was, then there was effectively my track record, which was very good on an aggregate with plenty of, you know, big holes in the ground that that's, that's mentioned. The, Fortunately, and to the credit of my partners at Mobius, it was a very short conversation about whether we should raise another fund as a team. And we very quickly, affirmatively decided not to. Um, we made a pretty dramatic weekend. You know, we went out for three days to determine the future of the firm, and we had a meeting, and then the first, you know, before we even had that first dinner, we decided, we sort of did a, uh, a round the table, you know, what people want to do, and we decided, no, nah, it doesn't make any sense. And so we're like, okay, we can spend the next three days just drinking it. <laughs> um, so, what we did was early in the cycle. So a lot of venture firms, you know, are are finally now in 2011, 2010, even 2009 going away. Sort of that had raised funds in 99, 2000, 2001. <coughs> there were some that sort of went away in the 2006 to 2008 time period. Um, we very deliberately in uh, the spring of 2006 decided not to raise another. We also did something which um, I've done a number of times with companies, which is when we realized that we had a finite life, in other words, this was not going to be a long-term vehicle, we figured out what our deals were. We all sat down and we figured out 
when people were going to leave, how long they were going to stick around, what the expectations were, what the economics were. We just did it all on the front end so there'd be no hard feelings. And we did it in a very specific way. This is your last date, you know, three years from now. For the last year, the expectations are, and until that point, the expectations are. You know, we went through that person by person. Very, very open with each other. And as a result, there's almost zero friction as time passed. As part of that also, I said, look, I'm gonna go raise another fund. If everybody's okay with that, yeah, of course. And are people okay if I ask a few of the existing Mobius people to, to team up with me if they want to, to go do a, another fund? Yeah, that's fine. I didn't say who it was at the time. I just wanted permission to do whatever I wanted to do it. And as part of that, a big lesson that I learned was to be deliberate about the thing you're creating. So when I was at um, uh, Mobius and you know, Softbank originally, it was accidental. I didn't choose my partners. I just woke up one day as partners. Um, it was just opportunity that came my way. They, they were good people. They weren't bad people. But when I look at it, I wasn't deliberate about it. And when I look at sort of how it played out, I sort of just ended up in this place. Um, with Foundry, uh, I think my partners have been, and I, and I have been very deliberate about how we approach things. When I think about David Cohen and Techstars and how he's built Techstars, he's been very deliberate sort of about each step of it. And when I think about some of the best entrepreneurs I've worked with, there's tons of chaos. So don't misinterpret deliberate for orderly and calm. That's not what I mean. Um, but the, the best entrepreneurs have been very deliberate. They spend a lot of time thinking about what they want it to be. And I think that was sort of lesson one. Lesson two, sort of to tie on, and then we'll go to where we want to the next question is, um, we had a strategy at the very front end. We spent a lot of time thinking about what's our strategy? What is, what is Foundry Group going to do? And we cast our strategy through a series, you know, I refer to them as deeply held beliefs, um, and they're, they're the following. We'll invest only in the US. So we include Canada in that, so we kind of think of Canada as more than the US. Um, and, you know, I could imagine a case where we make an exception and do something outside the US, but it would have to be a real exception, and it would be one that we really struggle with to do. We only do software internet. Um, we're early stage investors. We don't have to be the first money in a company, but we invest early. And for us, that meant uh, if there's more than $3 million already invested in a company, it's probably too late for us. We only invest in a set of themes that we feel like we know really well. So we like this horizontal, sort of vaguely defined thematic approach where the themes are filtered so that we can basically spend absolutely no time on things that are outside the theme. If anybody's ever sent me an email and gotten an immediate rejection, um, you know, hey, sounds interesting, but not in one of our themes, it's because it's not in one of our themes, and as a result, we don't want to waste your time because we're not going to do it. So we don't have to spend a lot of time on that sort of stuff. Um, we decided we wanted to have as much of the companies that we could have while still having the appropriate dynamic with the entrepreneur. So we don't have like a magic, we have to have 20%. We have some companies where we have less. And we also don't have like a, we can't have more than 40%. We have had some companies where we had 70%. So we don't have a, a particular percentage dynamic. And our view is um, we're trying to play a very long-term game with the companies. So we don't, we describe ourselves as being syndication agnostic, which means we're completely ambivalent as to whether or not we're agnostic, as to whether or not we have a co-investor. We're perfectly happy to do the Series A by ourselves, the Series B by ourselves, the Series C by ourselves. If along the way the entrepreneur wants another investor in the mix, or somebody else that we like working with is in the mix, or somebody works with us at the front end of the deal and does it together, that's fine. But we don't want to be in a position where, we saw this with Mobius, where we're constantly having to go find a new investor for every subsequent round. Again, as part of our, our sort of deeply held belief. Two others, we would never have any junior people work for us. So one of the things I think was a huge mistake at Mobius was having all of these associates running around. And I think it was a huge mistake, it is a huge mistake at many venture firms. The great entrepreneurs don't want to deal with the associates. Um, and frankly, venture capital is not a scale business from my frame of reference. So for us, we decided we were going to be a firm that was constrained in size, and the way to constrain things in size one is by people. So no junior people, no, we would never add a partner. And the second was, whatever our first uh, fund was, that would be the same size as all subsequent funds. <clears throat> so our first fund, we went out for $175 million, we ended up with 225, sort of an artifact of us being able to raise more, 
um, and having some investors wanting us to raise less, but at the same time saying, but I want a $40 million piece. So give me as much as I can have, but don't raise more than 200. And you know, we sort of settled out at 225, and we said that's going to be the size of the next fund and the next fund. Every two, three, four years, we'll raise another fund at the same size. So when we raised the fund in 2010, first fund was 2007, raised the fund in 2010, um, it was exactly the same size, 225. So you know, that sort of encapsulates, if you go all the way back to the beginning, sort of encapsulates our strategy. And the idea was that we were very deliberate about choosing each other and choosing that strategy. And then, you know, I'm very proud of the fact, looking back over the last four years, that we've been very, very focused on it. It's worked very well for us so far. If the strategy is the wrong strategy, then we'll be, we'll suck. Um, and, you know, if the strategy is the right strategy, and it doesn't mean that you have to be rigid in terms of the tactics within the strategy. Was that for the next 20 years, this strategy will be very effective in terms of organization technology investment. <clears throat> is there a distinction between planning and thinking deliberately? So for example, you started with a certain investment thesis around themes. Maybe give us an example of a new theme that has emerged and talk about the deliberate process and then does that carry over to the portfolio companies that you work with as well in terms of do you encourage them to take a similarly deliberate approach? Yeah, there's a huge difference between being deliberate and planning. So planning in my worldview is a methodical, structured approach to, to, to deciding what you're going to do in that and then putting something in place so that an organization can execute it. Being deliberate is, and, and that's very tactical. So I think of planning activities as very tactical activities. Um, I personally try to spend as little time as I can planning. Um, uh, being deliberate, I view as a much more strategic activity, where you're, you spend time on the front end of something, thinking about what the frame is, thinking about what box it's going to be in, what the parameters around it are and how you're going to then execute it. And then you execute it uh, recognizing that there's going to be lots of modifications along the way. For uh, a venture fund, I think planning is anathema. I think it's very, very hard to plan because there's so much exogenous activity that you have to be able to be reflexive about. You have to pay attention to what's going on in the world. It changes constantly. You're dealing with allocations that are not easily fixed or measurable in some time frame. In a company, planning is actually a critical part if you're trying to scale a business because you have lots of people in the organization that you need to go do stuff. And if it's not clear over a, a rhythm of you know, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, <laughs> annually, what people are trying to do, it's very hard as you get down. You know, a couple of people might be able to handle, handle it without that, but as you get further down the organization, it's very hard. However, I think the leaders of an organization have to be incredibly deliberate. And so, the, especially the CEOs. So the CEOs, I think, they're the best understand the importance of planning, build a team that will execute a plan, and then the CEOs spend some amount of their time paying attention to that uh, and just providing oversight, but not a lot of time in the implementation of it, and instead spend their time forward-facing supporting the implementation of it, as well as thinking broadly and more deliberately about what has to happen to the business. Make sense? Uh, I want to talk about a different line of deliberate choices that you've made, and that is the extent to which you invest your time and energy in social media and in really getting your ideas out there. And so you have blogs, you have books, you do things like this. I, I read that you're now Skyping into conferences to give keynote addresses. And in thinking about that, it's, it's clear what other people get out of that. It's clear what potential entrepreneurs could get out of Ask the VC. But I wonder why it's worth it to you. So the, there's um, a very specific driver that I have for almost everything I do. Certainly everything I do in the context of business. Most of what I do in life, but not all of it. Um, and I described it in a post I wrote about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And, and to answer the question, I have to define the difference. Extrinsic motivation is, uh, for those of you that, that doesn't, I'll define my words so you have them at least. Extrinsic motivation uh, are people who are motivated by external forces. Hey Brad, you look good today. You know, hey Jill, that was a great question. And Jill gets a little dopamine jolt. Oh good, that was a great question. Brad liked my question. Or, um, you know, you get your, your picture in the newspaper, uh, you know, for something good. Uh, that's a, that's uh, 
that, that's external um, or explicit. Implicit motivation is something internal, something that drives you otherwise. And for me, that's learning. And I, on a spectrum of one to ten, I'm not a one, but I'm pretty close. I'm maybe a two or three. I, I'm flattered by the public positive stuff, but I don't really give a shit about it. Um, I don't actually care if you guys like this or not. Um, I'm having fun. <laughs> right? So if, if, if you're uninterested, that's fine. I like to listen to myself talk for an hour. That's good. Um, my implicit driver is learning. And so if I walk out of here and I don't learn at least one thing tonight, this will have been a failure. Now, I expect I'll learn one thing from a question somebody asked, um, from a nuance in terms of something. I often learn when I'm describing or talking about things. Part of why I do a lot of writing is that that's one of the ways that I learn, but I actually learn by, by speaking. You don't necessarily integrate it in real time, but when you reflect, you're like, oh, that was an interesting idea that I hadn't thought about before. Um, as part of that, um, I believe, and I derive enormous amount of implicit uh, and intrinsic satisfaction, and the word, I should be careful with the words so I don't mix them all up, but intrinsic satisfaction from, um, from teaching and from exposing information that was previously uh, opaque or difficult to get at. And I was an entrepreneur in the 1980s and early 1990s, and it, yeah, I was an angel investor you know, in 94 to 96. I've been a venture investor since. It's always been a complete, utter mystery to me why so much of the information around creating companies was so mysterious. And if you look at what you have to do today to create a successful company, you look what you had to do 30 years ago, many of the things are exactly the same. There's lots of things that change because the environment that we're operating in changed. But many of the underlying things are unchanged. And uh, if you look at the process of creating a high growth company, not a small business, not a corner retail local store, but a real high growth company, there's a lot of stuff that even today is still very poorly codified. And part of my effort to understand that and to codify it in my own mind is to write about it, talk about it, interact with people about it in an extracurricular sort of way versus just practice it in the context of the companies because I learn a lot from that. So that's, that's the driver there. So if people watch the music video or if they read a blog post and they misinterpret it or misinterpret you or your motivations, you know. I don't care that much. So, it's interesting, you know, you, you watch the video that we just did, uh, I'm a VC, and there's multiple interpretations, um, including the fact that it's just extraordinary performance art by uh, four, you know, four middle-aged white guys, of which two can sing and maybe one can dance. Um, and, you know, it's very, it's, it's an attire, right? So if you, if you, you know, if you go back to Shakespeare, right, it's a classic satire. It is remarkable to me how people don't get that. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. So I find that interesting to sort of see how people react to it. Um, it's uh, VCs who don't take themselves very seriously in the context of an industry, venture capitalists, who generally take themselves pretty seriously, and one can argue take themselves way too seriously, um, in an environment where the only reason the VCs exist is because of the entrepreneur. And yet, so many VCs put themselves hierarchically one up on the entrepreneur. And so, as a satire, if you look at it as a satire, you really see that come through. So, I look at what we did, and I'm really pleased with the outcome of, you know, frankly, it's Jason's invention, but of, of sort of that art. And people that get it, that's rewarding. Sure, I like it that people like it, and it sort of bums me out when somebody doesn't get it. But not really, right? Like, not in a, oh my gosh, I'm checking to see, you know, how we did. And I, I think that's interesting because it sort of plays across lots of lots of things, you know, in that regard. The Bloomberg TV thing, I mean, it's really fun that that they did the show. I think it's really interesting. I think it's going to be really powerful. I think there's a lot of people that just don't understand what goes on inside an early stage company that's going from three people or two people to fun, uh, first round of funding. And this is a chance to expose that. I mean, you know, a lot of people in this room know what that is. There's an awful lot of people that are sitting there, wherever they are, sitting there listening to whatever bullshit is on Bloomberg and CNBC with guys in ties that are too tight talking about Greece that don't actually, and then they hear this, you know, jobs, 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 you know, it's the future, entrepreneurship's the future, but they have no idea what it means. It's just some French word that we've co-opted. 
And so I like participating in getting that out there and sort of laying the base for it. You could even argue it's a satire of a satire in terms of. Uh, <laughs> yes, there you go. Fair enough. But the greater piece I wanted to follow up on, and I, I don't think I'm speaking too out of school here, um, in terms of what you find to be the highest value of life, talk about creators and entrepreneurs. And you know, we often think about the ultimate win out of this being money, which is obviously a big driver. It's why LPs put their money with you and you take stakes in companies. But I get the sense that creativity and making something, making new forms, is, uh, is probably more important. Yeah, so, so separate, um, let's separate a couple things. My job is a really, really simple job. Um, I have investors who give me a box of money. And my job is to give them back a much bigger box of money. And if I do that, I'm successful. And if I give them a <coughs> smaller box of money back, they're not going to give me any more money, and I'm not successful. Very, very simple. I think we saw that box in the video. Different box. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that's my job. Now separate what drives me from my job. So I'm fortunate in one regard, which is, um, you know, I, I, I'm of the category of self-made. Um, my, my dad is a doctor. My mom's an artist. We had you know, plenty of money growing up, so I didn't have, you know, I had a, a typical middle class, what well, I say, typical middle class Jewish uh, uh, upbringing, um, where education and learning was a very, very high value. Um, I, my parents paid for undergraduate college, and that's all they ever paid for. So even when I was in high school, I was making more money than I knew what to do with. And then in college, when I was a freshman and sophomore, I got paid royalties on software that I wrote. And my, I don't remember what the number was, but let's say my freshman year I made thirty or forty thousand dollars, and my sophomore year I made eighty or ninety thousand dollars of royalty. So I had all this, you know, at that moment in time, all this extra money that, you know, never put me in a position where I felt like I needed to accumulate money to accomplish what I was doing. So that's never, and it, that's continued. So, and you know, some of that's a function of success. It's not predictable. It's not because of earning power and salaries and stuff like that. It's because I've invested in things, and some things have worked. And, as my wife and me likes to say, a box of money fell out of the sky. And then, you know, there will be periods of time where there are no boxes of money. And then another box of money falls out of the sky. So, but that's, that's separable from what's interesting to do. And I've always, um, I've always lived life very intensely um, in whatever I do. Some of it's an obsessive personality. Some of it's the way I'm wired. Some of it's probably my parents' influence on me. <laughs> And some of it's just what I like. Um, and probably at some point along the way, um, and I, I wasn't very old. I was, I was in my 20s when I had this thought, uh, which was that there's only one way to affirmatively determine the moment at which your life ends. And people aren't always successful when they try to kill themselves. But there's really only one way. And so it's completely uncertain when the lights go out. And if it's uncertain when the lights go out, the idea of trying to segment the time and break it into pieces where you do a certain thing for 10 years or 20 years and then you know you defer your travel around the world experience until after you've retired, well you might not get to that. You hear those tragic stories all the time. And so relatively young in my adult life, I decided that there was no real way to separate work and life. And that I was just simply going to try my hardest every day at getting the most out of the experience of life that I could, whatever that meant at the time. Now, I haven't always done that well. Um, I've gone through phases where, uh, you know, I got divorced when I was in my uh, early 20s. Um, I'm fortunate that I hooked up with a woman, Amy, that I've now been together with for 20 years. A phenomenal relationship. Our relationship almost ended uh, when, I was, when I was 35. Um, in about 2000 during this time period that was really chaotic. I mean, she was done with me and, and uh, me spending 110 hours a week on work and all she got, she referred to it as the dregs. You know, I'd come home on the weekend, I'd sleep all weekend and then I'd gear up to leave again. And you know, every now and then we'd have sex and that just wasn't enough. Um, but you know, it was a dynamic where you know, I wasn't, uh, I didn't have the sense of what was important in the context of living my life. And I'm 45 now. That's the drive. 
I, I want to do things. I don't, I don't have to have fun every moment. I have lots of moments that are not fun. I have plenty of down cycles. I have plenty of frustrations. Uh, I have plenty of moments of deep darkness where I go hide under a table in a corner of my house somewhere. Um, and, you know, I have lots of things that I have to deal with that are shitty. But that's part of the experience of life. But I don't defer the other stuff during that. And I sort of look at it as a unit of a day because days are pretty cyclical. I mean, you, you start, you have your day, you end, you go to sleep, you start the next day. And you know, it stretches out over time. But I think that's become the fundamental driver for me. And then all the other stuff I do is choices of how I spend that time. So a different part of that work-life balance is the sort of public-private balance. And that's one thing that struck me as I watch you swimming in Italy or that's France. David, that's David's fault. Um, <laughs> and running and know where you were in July, where you were in August, which things you like doing, which things you like reading. How do you draw that line? So it, it, it's very interesting how it evolves. So when I, I, I was not particularly public before I started blogging in like 2004. Um, I wasn't private, but I, you know, I wasn't like a, uh, you know, I did talks like this and stuff like that, but I didn't. I didn't go out of my way to attract attention. Um, in 2004, I started blogging, and my motivation for blogging was twofold. One is I wanted to really understand the technology. So I'm scared. Have a good dinner. Thanks for coming. Um, anybody else gets bored? Um, the uh, uh, let's do that. People listen to me. <laughs> they don't care. I don't care. <laughs> the, um, uh, I wanted to understand the technology. So user-generated content was starting to emerge. Um, I was very interested in RSS, which was a protocol that was underlying blogging. And I've always been a product guy, so I like to play with the technologies. And you know, there's plenty of software that's hard to play with that's technical, but, but I still like to play with the technologies, even if it's hard to play with them. This was relatively accessible. So that was thing one. As I started understanding the pieces, I also wanted to understand what the experience of being a blogger was. So if you think back to 2005, 2004 is a little early, 2005, 2006, there was a lot of discussion about the difference between newspapers and real journalism and bloggers, which still is. Um, And so, uh, so, so the sort of difference between um, uh, journalists and bloggers, but really it was the idea that you write something, you press publish, and it's there. And you can't really retract it. Once it's on the internet, I mean, you know, clichéishly, but once it's out there, you can't take it back. It's indexed. I mean, yeah, you can work hard and get rid of it, but it's, it's gone. Um, or it's out, it's out there. So I wanted to understand that feeling. So those were the two drivers. What happened was, um, I felt like I had a lot to say. And I always had this fantasy, if we can just step on it. <laughs> um, damn, um, we, we always, I always had this fantasy about writing a book, about trying to do something around, you know, encapsulating this knowledge. And I found the perfect vehicle for it. I found this thing, I controlled it, I could write whatever I wanted to write, I could have whatever errors I wanted to have in it, I pressed publish, it was mine. If nobody wanted to read it, fuck them. They didn't have to read it. And remember, I didn't really care who read it, so I was just happy to sort of do the process. And that built on itself. So, you know, I think the first major thing that got real notoriety was the term sheet series that Jason and I did that, that was the inspiration for this book. Uh, and that was in 2005. There were a couple of very early venture capital bloggers, me, Fred Wilson, a guy, David Hornet, that did a lot to sort of demystify venture capital. In 2006, 2005, 2006, 2007, when Web 2.0 was sort of hitting the forefront, and we were using the technologies we were talking about. So, you know, that then played into using social media, not so much to, you know, amplify the message, but just to understand what these things actually were and to be deeply enmeshed in the technologies that we were investing in. And then that's, to some degree, if you're any good at it, it's a self fulfilling prophecy. It's very interesting when you watch people try to use these technologies when they suck at it, because it's very obvious that they are, it's forced. 
Right? It's like a, a tennis player that, that's you know, pushing the ball all the time. And he's like, that's not very good tennis versus somebody that just gets out there and just swings. And so over time, um, you know, that, whether it was rational or not, that increased visibility. Um, and I have always had a governor, a governor problem, like in a car. Like I, 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 I redline and then I crash and I have to like, right? I mean, it, it doesn't, it doesn't sort of, I don't sort of back off and modulate it very well. Um, and this was a good case of that, which is, you know, at some point I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll answer anybody's request for an interview. And then at some point you realize all you're doing is interviewing, so interview, so you gotta figure out how to actually make that little box of money turn into a bigger box of money and get that right. But that's I think that's part of the challenge of integrating all of these different pieces together. So that's really you know how we got how we started. So I actually went back and your first blog entry I think was May 7, two thousand four. Um, and in the respondents, Cecilia Feld <laughs> responds, is it blog or brag? Either way, you have a nice writing style. Remember to write about your mother. <laughs> That's exactly what my mother would write, right? Like, you know, dear, dear son, don't let your head get too big. And oh, by the way, yeah, you, you write okay, but don't forget to talk about me. Perfect. Um, one thing that you wrote, I wanted to follow up on this in terms of where you see technology going. So as of 2005, you said to quote, the biggest thing that I've become obsessed with lately is how stupid my computer is. Question, do you still see computers as stupid? And more importantly, where do you see things going in the next three to five years in terms of technology? Yeah, so they're still stupid, but they're less stupid. Um, it's it's been uh, and there's lots of different things that have changed. That some has been sort of a natural evolution of hardware and software. See, just sheer amount of capability <coughs> of the network infrastructure um, and availability of the network infrastructure. Some of it has been UI dynamics in terms of being easier. But there's also flip flip balances the other day. How many people here have a, a, a phone that's an iPhone or an Android phone that you type on? And how many of you walk down the street like this? <laughs> oh, sorry. I mean, do you think in 20 years you're gonna be doing that? We better not be. Right? So so the idea that the technology is still in this form that is not um, you know, comfortably encapsulated uh, is, is a challenge. The idea, though, that we could, even in, in 2005, do a YouTube video of that quality, you know, in Jason's basement with zero professional help. I mean, you, you see how far this is coming. Or, for example, I was watching today, uh, instead, of, instead of making my small box of money bigger, um, I was watching the U.S. Open all afternoon on my computer. <laughs> tell Brad. Well, they, it wasn't over when I was there. And then when I was driving over here in my car, I was watching the U.S. Open on my phone <laughs> while I was driving my car. Um, but don't tell anyone. And uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's real progress. But at the same time, think of all of those moments where you're like, somebody sends you an email to schedule something. And it doesn't just happen, right? And the number of emails back and forth still, I mean, that, the group scheduling problem is still not solved. Or the 19th email that you got but you just want it to go away. You don't ever want to hear about somebody's bunny rabbit anymore. <laughs> right? So there's still uh, there's still an awful lot that can improve, but it's pretty significantly better than it was in 2005. All right, so one more question, we'll, we'll open it up. You asked yeah. me, you asked me what's gonna happen yeah. in the next three to five years. So I don't I don't want to talk about the next three to five years, I want to talk about the next 20 years. So I believe the machines have already taken over. I believe the machines are really patient. So they know that they can just hang out for a thousand years, and we're just going to enter all of human information into them. <laughs> and that's what we're doing. And if you think about the evolution of this in a, in a pragmatic way, 20 years from now, I don't know whether we will call them biological computers or computer-enhanced humans, but the idea that there's a bridge between humans and computers in a very deep, intertwined way uh, is something I believe very deeply in. And part of the reason I'm so motivated to, to work on the companies and invest in the companies that we're involved in is I want to be, you know, I want to make sure I get enough back doors in that. So, you know, 20 years from now I know how to sort of work, work the system. Um, but it's it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's not very far-fetched. I mean, think about how many people here, probably not that many, but how many people here have ever counted calories, tried to lose weight, kept track of what you ate? 
isn't that a stupid process? You know, you write it down on a piece of paper, or you type it into your computer, you try to remember what you eat, and then you go out to a restaurant and you lie. <laughs> I didn't eat a basket of chips and guacamole. I had 10 chips and that's only 40 calories, right? I mean, shouldn't we just have a thing in us that keeps track of all the nutritional stuff that's flowing through us? How many people here are diabetics? Anybody have an have a insulin pump here? Do you have to still measure your blood sugar and I'm give yourself pills? You're just pills. So you make you make product well. So you're unique though because you have type two light. Okay. If, you know most people that have have type one or, or type two more significant. They have an insulin pump, um, but you still have to do a test manually. And it's a feedback loop. It's just a feedback loop. Why can't you have a thing plugged into you that's constantly monitoring, monitoring your blood sugar? And when your blood sugar gets below some threshold, gives you some insulin. And the reason is because we haven't accepted as humans that we can automate away that problem. And so the FDA is afraid that, that one person is going to go haywire and they're going to get too much insulin and they're going to die. But the technology is there. So in 10 years, the technology, you know, however it is, whether it's you take a pill and that pill has a sensor in it that can actually sense, you know, what your, what your glucose level is. That's right. Whole swaths of, of our automation dynamics will like that. And uh, it's pretty cool. All right, last question, we'll open up uh, for audience questions. Uh, the Zynga story. So can you take us through, did you have any reservations about doing the deal? Was it a no-brainer at the start? And did you see this kind of scale on the horizon? Um, so it was a no-brainer when you were Mark is the CEO for 15 years. We've done a couple of his previous, invested in a couple of his previous companies. Um, it was the first investment we made out of our foundry group fund in 2007. Uh, the decision cycle was Matt incredibly passionate about what he was doing. Um, you know, had a big vision for it. Uh, and we got on Mark and we got on the big vision because we were comfortable with the idea, you know, that the big vision had potential. Did I have any expectation that it would turn into what it turned into? No way. Um, you know, I think we were optimistic and hopeful that it would be a significant contract. Surpassed anyone's rational expectations, um, and uh, you know there have been moments in time where you know you just sort of sit back and go, like, "Holy shit, this is incredible!" Um, you realize that every year there's probably one or two companies that gets created like that, and you know in the career of an investor, having one of those you know every decade is awesome. You have one of those in your whole career as an investor is still awesome. Um, but if you think about it, you really are, it's very hard to like, pick those. And so um, the lessons that I personally have gotten from being involved in this company from the beginning um, are, are pretty significant and they've really shaped a lot of my thinking. Um, the biggest is uh, the reinforcement that the entrepreneur drives the business. Um, Mark had an incredible desire to be very significant. And he wanted inputs from everybody, and he wanted constant help, but he wanted to drive the business. And I think many investors try to control the entrepreneur, strengths around the entrepreneur, they try to put some structure around the system. Um, the entrepreneurs who understand how to work with investors and work with the scales of business, but are just going to fucking run through the wall no matter what. And the as an investor recognizing my job is to control them. My job is to do whatever I can to help them. I had that philosophy, but this just drove it home in spades. Um, and it's, it's, it's been a great experience. All right, we have a Silicon Flatiron tradition. First question to a student. Best question gets a book. Fresh. What is there with your about? Sure. So I can't talk about Zynga specifically because they're in registration, so the comments are generic, OK? Um, my, my, my general view is that uh, it's highly entertaining that uh, everybody wants to talk about whether we're in a bubble or not in a bubble. Um, and the dynamics of what's going on in terms of fundamental companies that are creating value um, and businesses that are building long-term sustainable businesses are very, very significant and very compelling. The valuations at any moment in time of those businesses, it's hard to predict what, whether those valuations at any moment in time are right or not. And if you look back at the thing everybody's referring to, which is what happened in 2000, 
uh, and, and sort of with the peak in, in, in 2000. The bubble was driven partly by technology, by, by startup companies, but was also driven by very large technology companies that were dramatically overvalued. And the amount of capital that was in those companies relative to their long-term performance was way out of whack with where they were valued. And um, I'm not a student of the public markets. I don't pay that much attention to the public markets. But I remember companies like Cisco being worth, uh, you might remember, $400 billion or something like that. What was level three worth in 2000? How much? $150 billion. $150 billion? Yeah. How much is it worth now? Like $7? $8? $6 billion? <laughs> 47 cents and change, right? I mean, you had this incredible dynamic that's not in the market today. So are individual companies overvalued any moment in time? Could be. The market will tell you over a long period of time. You have such a massive inflation of value uh, of, of what people are willing to pay for these assets that we're in this cataclysmic moment that's going to burst. Will stupid companies go public? Will companies get bought for too much money? Will people make bad decisions? Of course, but that's human beings. I mean, we're going to do that. That's, that's going to happen forever. But I, I mean, some, I mean, some people have to look at uh, overestimation is driven by uh, venture capital investment. Uh, I mean, do you agree with that? No. Okay. How concerned are you about the um, attempts by foreign countries and very smart people locally who play that cat and mouse hacking security game, everything associated with those, some of whom are very formidable, who uh, desire to compromise the kinds of businesses that you invest in. How concerned are you going to impact the attractiveness and viability of these kinds of businesses over the next 15 years? Yeah. Sorry, so give me other questions. How concerned am I that uh, bad hackers, both here in the U.S. and internationally, are going to compromise the value of companies that I'm investing in? Today? That's good enough. Yeah. Um, I'm not at all concerned about them compromising the values. I think any of the companies I'm involved in take all the security companies seriously. And the end this challenge is a challenge that they're going to go over. But you think that the, that the technology to avoid that is going to be good enough? Yeah. yeah. I think it's a constant struggle, but I think I think if your company is too small to be relevant, it doesn't matter. And when your company becomes large enough to be relevant, you know, the tools and technologies available to you, as long as you take it seriously, exist to stay ahead of the problem, recognizing that there's always going to be exception cases, there's always going to be things to get through. But across the board, you know, I, I, I very take it very, very seriously, but not fundamentally concerned. Lopez founder of Influential Force, and my question is that for Foundry Group, you early stage investors, how do you find early stage? Two guys with an idea, or or um, two guys with a product that already has adoption by customers? At what stage are you more likely to invest? Either. <laughs> Seriously? No, no. Yeah, but like for example, for Mark, uh, right? Like you already have history with him, so if he had an idea, you're like, okay, I can invest. With you know, but when we invested, he had already he had already built uh, Texas stuff happening. So shine bombs in the room. Uh, Pete started a company uh, called Mandelbrot, um, which makes uh, the announcement makes still makes bread, Jewish bread. Um, you know, when when Pete had an idea, the original idea that Pete had, what the business is doing today is uh, has has you know roots of that, but has evolved. But it was just an idea, and it was you know. And another guy that we really thought highly of. And then we have other companies that invested in this company, Fitbit, uh, which makes uh, this thing, which is a pedometer, but not really. It's actually an accelerator, accelerometer, a gyro that's a step counter. Um, the new one coming out uh, has some new, interesting, exciting technology, and it'll do things beyond just steps. I also does sleep. And it's part of my view of human instrumentation. I passed on these guys before they shipped their first product because I just wasn't comfortable that they had built the product. They shipped it. Um, I used the product. I really liked the product. I continued to sort of struggle with making the investment. And I finally pulled the trigger after they probably sold about 10,000 of them. 
um, and they raised a couple million bucks. So it's all over the place. I mean, I think our, our model is if you've raised more than $3 million, you're too late for us. I have one personal question. The, those times when we lost some more. Scared some more off. Thanks, guys. Those days that you have where you where you're you know not feeling good and hiding under the table as you described it. Do you blog anyway? And if you do blog anyway, I mean, is it fake it till you make it? I mean, if you're just feeling horrible, how do you sit there and say, okay? Here's the shiny new bit of news. Or what, yeah. What's your philosophy? So, so on if you if you read my blogs, you'll see you'll see negative stuff in my blogs. I'm not always a cheerful, uh, cheerful Joe. Um, although I'm, I'm a pretty happy human, so sort of externally, uh, I I think it's hard. I, I don't get angry very easily. It takes a lot to make me really angry. So I don't think you see me in that sort of a mode very often. Um, there's a little snark. You see plenty of sarcasm when I'm in those kinds of moods where I'm feeling a little bit down and negative about the world. And I have a little grumpiness in me about things that I don't think are working well, which I think most people interpret as constructive feedback. Right? So I think you know, Brad, who works with me, you know, a bunch of stuff, when I'm being negative about something, I don't think he views me as being fundamentally down on it. I'm just trying to point at the thing I don't like, and that's one way of doing it. So I think people have to interpret how everybody presents that information. But for me, I just kind of power through it. I mean, I don't go, I don't go high. Yeah. Because what happens is even on a day you know, that's, that's a down day, it's not necessarily a whole day. It might be two or three hours. I, I run marathons. I know that I'm going to run a marathon on Saturday in, uh, in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, because I'm running a marathon every day, you got to do one in North Dakota, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have a tweet that I say, what, what's the best restaurant in Bismarck, North Dakota? The first thing that came back was the airport. <laughs> I got a serious email from somebody saying there was a big boy in Bismarck, and they listed the things on the menu that were really good. I should bring my own power bars because they probably have those in my um, And uh, so I'm going to run this marathon on Saturday. You know, two days after marathon, most marathons are on Sunday. Two days after marathon, I'm always depressed. I always have a credible emotional love that usually doesn't go away until the third or fourth day. Uh -huh. So I know that I'm going to be not in great form on Monday, and probably not in great form on Tuesday when I'm back here. I look at my schedule for those two days. They're completely blocked. I mean, they're full days. So I kind of you know, know that going in. My assistant knows that going in. And I can kind of calibrate how I spend my energy against it. Right? So, some, so it's, not, it's not just, oh, I wake up and I'm in a shitty mood. Right? It's that sometimes it's the rhythms of these. Amy and I came back from a month in Tuscany, and last week sucked. Last week was a hard week. It was incredibly busy. Sort of, you know, first week back, right? It was just packed. It started on Tuesday, so it was a short week anyway. Um, every day was a full, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning till, you know, 9 or 10 at night kind of day. I was tired. I went to Colorado Springs Thursday night. It's been all day Friday, Thursday night at a, at a dinner, and then all day Friday, Colorado Springs talking to entrepreneurs. Got back late Friday night. I had a bad week. I was in a bad mood all weekend. It was all re-entry. So Amy, instead of getting all annoyed with me because I was in a bad mood, even though we had our own little flare-ups over the weekend, we both knew we were re-entering, and we were going to sort of be in a bad place. And so I think as a, as a person, understanding those dynamics about yourself comes back to the question that Jill asked. If you have perspective on how you are, then you can still work through those moments and be pretty functional. Um, Two more questions. Yeah. So uh, a tech startup graduate recently told me that an entrepreneur can't have a serious relationship because the startup is their wife and mistress. What are your thoughts on this? And if it's not true, how do you make peace between the two? Yeah. So, so I, I don't think it's true. Um, and in fact, if you look at a lot of the tech stars, uh, uh, founders, they have a serious relationship. And in fact, some of the, the this year, two of the tech stars founders were married and had a kid, young kid too, like, uh, under two. I, I don't know, kid, I don't understand kids very well. <laughs> I'm scared of until they're about fifteen. And, and so I don't, I can't look at one and say how old it is. I'm trying to avoid them. 
I, I, that's, the, that's the question that gets the book. I like that question. Um, the, uh, the thing that I think is so important is that when you're early in your entrepreneurial arc, it's extremely hard to figure out how to balance your work, yourself, and a relationship. And yourself is an important part of that. Right? And Dan can attest to this. You can't be a successful entrepreneur over a long period of time unless you have time for you. Because as a leader of a company, there's a whole bunch of people counting on you. And in a relationship, in a family, you've got people counting on you. And as a human, if you don't have time just for you, when you're young, when I was in my 20s, I had no idea how to even think about it. And it took me a divorce and then, you know, 10 years of being with somebody who, you know, I've got into 20 years and have an amazing relationship. And I had an amazing relationship for those 10 years. But to almost break that relationship too, to get to the point where I said, I have to figure this out for me. And so in my mid-30s, I stepped back and with Amy's help, figured it out for me in a way that works. And for me, it was very rule-based. Right? So I've written about this a lot. It's going to be more faster, but I'll give you a sense of it. When, when Amy and I's relationship almost blew up, it was over a weekend. We were on vacation. Um, we were with friends in Rhode Island. I was working and working all the way down with her. And then we were at her friend's house, and I was on the phone while we were at her friend's house. And then we got to dinner. And in 30 minutes of dinner, I took a phone call. And the thing I was working on was a company that failed anyway. Just for perspective. And I come back from dinner, and you know, it's dessert, my food's on eat, and everybody's a little annoyed with me and Amy's kind of pissed at me. We go back to our friend's house, we sit around for a little while, uh, we go to bed, and, and we're in bed, and she turns to me and she says very quietly, I'm done. And I'm 35, I'm doing, you know, I'm not 23. And I say to her, oh, what a tough week. Yeah, I'm really tired. This was a lot of work, a lot of shit going on. <laughs> shook her head and said, no, no, you're a crappy roommate. I just don't want to live this way. I love you. I just don't want to live this way. I'm done. I'm done with this relationship. I said, no, time out. Whoa. Back up. I'm off the cliff. Like, I'm not done. And, you know, we talked and, like, I got her back to a place where she was at least willing to talk about it over the course of the weekend. And, of course, you know, at the end, a thing that you can only do every now and then, I started to register her over my stomach. I said, is it going to <laughs> and she laughed just enough so that I knew I at least had not to get it. <laughs> but a chance that you know, we'd be able to have a conversation about it for the next day. We spent the whole weekend talking. I, I, the next morning I gave her my phone I said, look, let's just talk through this. Let's let me understand this. Give me one more chance. And I said, give me some rules. He says, oh, that's stupid. I don't want you to do rules. It's like, like no. Like, I have an engineer's brain. Give me some rules. Let's just make them up. Whatever the rules are, and I'll just follow the rules for a while. We'll see how it goes. We made up some rules. Rules like no phone in our house except in my office. So the only time I can be on the phone in my house is when I'm in my office. I have to choose to be on the phone. Um, uh, we have dinner the first night of every month. We call it life dinner. And it's a check. It's not date night. We go out plenty of other times. It's looking backwards the previous month, looking forward the next month. Uh, we have a quarterly vacation, one week off the grid every quarter. No phone, no email, one week we go somewhere, my assistant can find me. Fortunately, my work life is constructed in such a way that I can do that. I can take a week off. It doesn't have to be a week, it could be a weekend. That just happened to be our rhythm. Um, and a whole series of other things like this. Uh, I was a shitty gift giver, I annoyed her. So on life dinner, we each give each other gifts. And I'll give her a piece of jewelry, you know, electronic thing. <laughs> she has a remote control fart machine. <laughs> it doesn't have to, don't have to be extravagant, but it's just the act of, and I become a good gift giver. Right, so it's, it's sort of these things, and you know, I look back, this is 10 years now, we evolved the rules, we've changed the rules, and one of the rules was that we could fail one out of eight times. And that was because every two years, I could have one of the quarters not work. So, you know, 12 and a half percent of the time, it's okay to fail. So the point is that, I was, you know, come back to the very beginning of the conversation about planning versus deliberate. This is not planning, right? This is deliberate. Uh, we create a set of rules, and a context for the set of rules, for how to have a relationship in the chaos that it is, you know, I still probably work, I don't know, she probably say 70, 80 hours a week, I don't know how much I work, I don't pay attention to it, but it's a lot. 
I can travel about half the time, and I love it. But I also love being with her, and I love having that time together, and I love doing things with her, and all of those things are important. And sort of figuring out how that works. Does she not get jealous? Of, of what? Of your other life? Um, it's her? No, I don't think so, because she's, she, she's fundamentally uh, an introvert. You know, she said, oh, it'd be fun to come tonight, but there'll be a bunch of people. <laughs> right? So, so um, no, she's, I mean, is, she, is she jealous that other people get my time? Sure. There are definitely moments where, you know, she wants more of it and wants me to trade off my time with you with her or my time working on this with her. But that's okay. I mean, you know, that balances out. There's plenty of time that she spends doing things that I wish that I didn't have to do. And I think that's the nature of it, right? In a relationship, you have to sort of be like those things. Last question. Last 17. Um, you guys can email me questions. I'm in an entrepreneurial class at the moment. And yeah. For our, well done. Almost killed. Maybe they may knocked out of one of these people. Or had it. Go ahead. Um, for our idea to work, we have to create an entrepreneurial, creative environment. And uh, I was wondering if uh, how you could do that as a third party perspective, third party on trying to create that creative. Environment. Also, I have another question. Um, you say you don't use. Um, partners and new partners, these interests. Right. So I'll take a swing at sure. paraphrasing the question. Yeah. So that it's a two-part question. Uh, the second part of which is the easy one, which is there's no analysts or junior members of the VC. Would you at all consider an intern at some point? The first question is the broader one. You're in a, uh, an entrepreneurship class <laughs> trying to think of a creative venture. How do you go about the process of starting on that? We're trying to create a creative area, much like a large space, a large space. Like, um, so you're trying to create a physical space to work in. How can a third party create, best create that, that <coughs> feeling because you want to create that entrepreneurial creative you want to help? How many, how many people are in this space? Probably like one to three. Okay. And, and so the whole class is trying to find a space like that that you can camp in and create an entrepreneurial context and it feels like that as you're working on this class. Is that what you're trying to do? We're, we're trying to create something that the brand is. Um, so it's an incubator, incubator of sorts? Exactly. Well, well, why do you need the, why do you need the, the incubator space? Why do you need the space? We're going to charge people. Huh. <laughs> why are you going to charge people? Because we, uh, we want to turn a property. And I think we get a fundamental intrinsic um, well-being if we actually and, and what are the companies that you're going to incubate? Are they other student-driven companies, or are they companies from the community? Community student-driven. Okay. So I would tell you that the uh, charging uh, charging to incubate companies is, uh, or charging for physical space, is the lowest form of Maslow's hierarchy. In our <laughs> so. Uh, I would encourage you, if that's, if the goal is to make money, um, I think that's a weak way to do it. Um, because young companies don't need space. And so the value, if you, if you look at sort of classic co-working space, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for people to locate in amongst each other. And having an organized infrastructure you can't charge a premium over what the market dynamics are. And so it, it just rarely works. So if you have, is, is that the venture you're trying to create in the context of this class? Yeah. Okay. Start a coffee shop. <laughs> start a coffee shop. No. I think that's, I just wanted to say, start a, start a place that has an ancillary service that attracts entrepreneurs and is set up for entrepreneurs. And if you send me an email, I'll introduce you to Neil Robertson. Okay. Neil has taken, he, his, his company Trot is in the Daily Camera Building. And they took a bunch of the space in the Daily Camera Building, they weren't working. And I've already forgot what they called it, it's called Code Space. Code, code Space. Code Space, yeah. And they, is anybody in Code Space here? Is it good? Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, so, you know, it's basically a space, it's free. It's free. Right? So that's the hierarchy again. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> and it's got free coffee. Um, but but the idea is that it's a place for people to hack together that haven't started in general. But but 
send me a note for adfl.com because you should go as part of the class. We'll talk to Neil and understand that. You should talk to David Cohen and understand how he thinks about it too in the context of tech stars. Because at the minimum, you still may go do it, but those two those two conversations will inform you. And the first, the other question was, uh, would we ever do interns? No, but um, lots of companies have invested in. And I think that you know, if you want to have an entrepreneurial experience while you're a student, you do, from my perspective, is aggressively get yourself involved in the Boulder entrepreneurial community. If you're a software developer, um, everybody wants hackers. If you're not a software developer, there's lots of other things to do you know, around product, around support, around sales, around marketing. And all, you know, there's an enormous amount of growth in the Boulder software community right now. And that's a great place to be an intern because you get two things. One is you learn some specific stuff, but you also really get the context of a fast-growing company, and you get to hang out in Boulder for the summer. I can help if people are interested in that. You know, feel free to send me emails on summer. And for those of you who are at, here at CU, there's about 15 CEOs, 20 CEOs who are probably looking for you right now. So I encourage you to. Yeah, <laughs> Rusty needs like all of you. I heard. Right? Brett, this has been fantastic. Many thank you. So a warm round of applause for Brett.